Good afternoon. Hi. Afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm thrilled to be here um, with two of the seminal figures and leading uh, thinkers in the development of blockchain. I hope to learn a lot. Uh, nominally, we're talking about what we don't know about blockchain, so I'm going to keep you busy from my perspective. Um, we're going to start with just to give us a foundation in exactly what Hyperledger does, exactly what consensus is. So Brian, let's start with you, please. Sure. So Hyperledger is an open source uh, collection of projects hosted at the Linux Foundation, which for uh, 15 years has been operating at the center of many large open source ecosystems. At Hyperledger, we're building a series of, you can think of them like building blocks for launching your own distributed ledgers, your own smart contract systems, that sort of thing. Uh, we're a consortium, so we're funded by our members, but our members also put in developer resources, and in fact, as an open source project, anybody can use the code for free, participate in its development, that sort of right. thing. Right, could you just, just give us a sense of who those members are? Sure. Two or so, three, maybe? So they range from co large companies like Intel and IBM to uh, uh, companies in other sectors like Change Healthcare and Aetna to startup companies uh, that are building blockchain technologies, uh, blockchain applications in lots of different sectors to a really international contingent too. About 40% uh, of our members are in Asia, about 25% headquartered in mainland China. So it's really a global effort. Thank you. Joe, what, what is consensus? Uh, so consensus, so need to give you, uh, I think, the full stack explanation. Please. Uh, so it all started with Bitcoin. Uh, Bitcoin was three separate inventions. It was the blockchain, um, the, the technology that we share, pretty much. Uh, it was the first application on public blockchains and then something called crypto economics, uh, which married the two. Uh, early 2012, uh, many of us started to believe that there should be more applications on blockchain, on on public blockchains in particular, and so uh, the Ethereum uh, platform uh, was invented in 2014, essentially, and realized uh, soon after. Um, it is a platform for decentralized applications, unlike Bitcoin, which is just a money platform. Um, Consensus is a company that was started one year into that journey to build many kinds of applications uh, uh, on mostly the Ethereum blockchain. We are focused on of uh, the public blockchain ecosystem, and we consider that the uh, decentralization ecosystem. So it's uh, essentially moving the world from a web 2.0 client server sort of architecture uh, to this peer-to-peer uh, -peer network uh, decentralized architecture where you have things like uh, trusted transactions, automated agreements, um, smart objects on a world computer, uh, on Ethereum, but you also have other protocols like decentralized storage, decentralized bandwidth, etc. cetera. Uh, consensus operates in that world, that Web3 decentralized worldwide web world. Um, we build products, we build infrastructure for that world. Uh, we also do enterprise and government consulting, similar to uh, the many different projects in uh, the Hyperledger Foundation. Uh, and we do education and, and we do a handful of other capital markets activities. Yeah. Thank you. So conceptually, how do these approaches to blockchain differ? And again, Brian, let's, let's start with you. And just, could you ground us in, in your approach, your outlook, your view right. of life? So I think there was a, a point of view that folks had a, a couple of years ago that uh, there will be many, uh, 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 let me just say a handful of public ledgers uh, that will serve as connective tissue in many ways and serve some really important functions like distributed digital cash. Uh, but there'll be a lot of permission ledgers as well. Um, uh, ledgers that are private to a given industry, to a given sector, uh, performing a number of use cases. And it might be around sharing healthcare records, it might be around uh, uh, doing wires and exchanges and banks. Um, and each of these different networks, uh, uh, it was worth taking a fresh technology perspective to ask, is there a way to serve them so they could be faster, it could be cheaper, and have a lot of different options when it came to how those tools are built. Uh, but then also recognize that these different networks are likely to have different governance functions as well. So in a way, we're kind of arms dealers in that we build this software and take these interesting different ideas and try to um, get them down a conveyor belt to production quality releases, things that these companies can run, but then leave the formation of the governance processes fundamentally up to them. So, yeah, so um, we, using the Ethereum technology, uh, build 
private permission systems for uh, companies, governments, consortia, but we're more focused on uh, the public uh, blockchain and decentralization infrastructure. Uh, in that context, uh, we build mostly open platforms. So uh, this technology has the ability to reduce or remove intermediaries. Um, it uh, enables us to change the architecture of business. Uh, so where businesses uh, serve their customers in often a somewhat adversarial relationship, uh, we can provide those same services in uh, protocol-based network open platforms uh, where there are lots of different actors in different roles, so multi-sided markets. Uh, none of those actors hopefully are overly controlling, uh, overly monetizing. Examples of that uh, are uh, Ujo Music, UJO, uh, which is in beta. It's enabling artists to upload their content. Uh, it's enabling um, consumers or other artists to acquire different kinds of licenses. Uh, that system uses another technology on the platform called Open Law, which is uh, hybrid legally enforceable agreements, uh, agreements that uh, are pros, uh, but also they have programmatic elements, so you can escrow money into those agreements, you can send data, um, those agreements can act when conditions are met. Would it be fair to say that you approach the idea of decentralization in different ways? Perhaps. And, and how yeah. so? It, it is, would it be fair to say that consensus and Ethereum yeah. is a more radically so I think it's a, Yeah, I think that's, that's a great point. I think it's a matter of degrees. What does that mean? Um, do, do you want to... Sure. So uh, each of these networks that I, that, that, you know, I kind of mentioned, right, each of these different distributed ledgers uh, are likely to have a governance uh, function of some sort. Kind of, you know, what does it mean to be on a, a healthcare data sharing network, for example? Uh, uh, there might be a need to protect the confidentiality of patient data that's being shared across it, right? Uh, or other ledgers that are based in different regions of the world where different regulations might apply. Uh, uh, and in those, to serve those needs, uh, uh, being able to stand up independent networks that uh, can, can bootstrap these applications, that can manage the sharing of this data, and map to those different regulatory requirements is essential. That doesn't mean that they don't talk to other networks, right? They can do that kind of on top with bridges between these different networks. Um, and, and, I, and I think as these networks grow and they get bigger, um, whoever serves as the referee in those networks, as the governing entity, as we'll call it, um, uh, it will be under pressure to make it easy to join, to be transparent in how they operate. Uh, and so I think we're going to find kind of this question of minimum viable centralization as being critical to rolling this technology out at a grand scale. So what, yeah, what so, is a radically decentralized? Yeah, so it's... Um, we build lots of different applications in different contexts, and we should choose the, the correct technology for each application. Um, Ethereum can uh, serve a private permission context where there is strong governance. You can get high transaction throughput in that sort of less decentralized context, uh, more governed context. Um, and these um, more like somewhat decentralized networks can talk to the public network uh, and do important things for those networks on the public network. Um, but the public network, a uh, radically decentralized network, uh, where a lot, there's a lot different, many different actors performing different roles and, and tens of thousands of nodes uh, securing the system, uh, I believe that's most appropriate in a world in which we're going to see the tokenization of many different kinds of assets and resources uh, what from, from the songs. By the uh, tokenization means that there is a uh, representation, uh, a digitally scarce representation of something in the world, whether it's a ticket or money uh, or a security or identity or a educational certificate. Uh, we're going to see the tokenization of uh, so many things uh, uh, as we move forward. This is referred to as an ICO or an initial So it, they can be issued uh, through a token launch, uh, for sure, but there are lots of other reasons. Uh, and many different markets will develop and will become deep and liquid and valuable when you start to tokenize so many different resources, again, Good. from songs to gold. Uh, when, when, you, when you do have um, so many liquid deep markets, you're going to have a lot of traders, a lot of actors uh, who are incentivized to potentially manipulate these markets. And so if you don't have radical decentralization, uh, you're going to get into difficult situations. There are 
uh, certain competing public protocols that are much less decentralized, and I think they'll be subject to collusion and manipulation. Yeah. Well, let me, let me try to uh, make it real by giving an example, which is, so 20 years ago, the diamond industry uh, was uh, requested by governments of the world to do something about blood diamonds, conflict diamonds. And so they got together and, and forged what is essentially a private sector treaty amongst them called uh, which, uh, the Kimberley Process, which was a traceability scheme that involved uh, having a certificate that accompanied every diamond as it made its way out of the ground to somebody's ring, right? And this was a paperwork heavy process that involved every time there's a handoff, faxing a copy of that cert uh, certificate with a new stamp on it to a central organization in Antwerp that then in theory you could do, you could trace the origin kind of like going to ancestry.com, right? But it was paper bound and it put a lot of power in the hands of that one organization in Antwerp. And so that industry has been moving to use a distributed ledger. Um, these diamonds are tracked like assets on a ledger. You know, somebody can only hand off a diamond once. They can't copy the diamond twice, right? Uh, and that is a way to ensure greater integrity in that system uh, that keeps fraud out, keeps uh, 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 the ability for bad actors in the middle to, to bring in a truckload of diamonds from the Congo and get them into the supply chain. What so that's tokenizing diamonds in a way. Uh, uh, and I could even trade, ultimately, at the end of that, it becomes a titling system for what diamonds that I might be able to trade or sell shares what is, in. What is the financial impact of all this? A number of years ago, the the media industry was faced with incredible competition from very, very low-cost startups. Is the same thing going to happen, say, to finance as the middle layer is taken out of finance as blockchain takes hold? Sure. So I think uh, we will uh, reduce or right-size intermediation. Uh, it's essentially a low barrier to entry, radically decentralized context, and that's an appropriate context for price discovery for the actual value of intermediation, uh, when you can have content creators, resource providers, service providers directly access their consumers or maybe through uh, some intermediaries which add value but uh, get paid appropriately, uh, you have uh, a different context for business. And I think it's going to be a tremendous growth driver, tokenizing all these things, money, agreements, identity, reputation, etc. Um, all when we enter into transactions involving those elements in our, you know, the, the current foundational elements uh, of our society are all filled with friction and delays. And so the clearing and settlement and all those transactions extends over long periods of time. When you tokenize everything, clearing and settlement can happen in the instant of the transaction. You squeeze out all the delays. Maybe regulators add a tiny bit of delay uh, to, to track things. Uh, but... Um, in we a world, we seeing so in, Goldman Sachs being disintermediated. Inter uh, well, not not necessarily, but you know, in a world like that, um, where you have very little delay, you can move value creation events much more closely in time and compound them. So, as with the value of compounding mm -hmm. interest, you create more value uh, more quickly. And, and so, Goldman, um, they're going to figure out uh, how they operate in this world, just as they have evolved over. Uh, a number of decades. Brian, where are we in the adoption curve and where where does blockchain find it, its um, early acceptance? You know, in 1995, you could kind of be forgiven if you didn't have a website. Um, I, you know, there were people putting websites up, people were starting to sell things online, and a little bookstore in Seattle was starting getting started right then as well. Um, I, and I think we're about at that stage, maybe a bit later. I mean, there are real, obviously, uh, large cryptocurrency networks out there, uh, dozens, uh, perhaps even hundreds, because this is kind of a dark matter of the internet, uh, private permission ledgers out there uh, within these different industries. So people are using it in production today, but you could still be kind of forgiven if your business wasn't, you know, a, a deploying a blockchain app today. I think the, the window for that is declining. And by 1999, if you didn't have a website and you didn't have some strategy for using it to reinvent some part of your business, you were kind of delinquent by that point. Your, your competitors are racing ahead of you. And so we're in that window. And certainly from an investment perspective, it feels like 99. Um, from the technology perspective, we're still bootstrapping. But Joe, there's stuff that you can run in production Joe, today. Where, um, what, are the, what are the resistance points, the, the challenges, the friction right now, uh, good option? Just building. Uh, so m many companies, consortia, governments are building their own intranets, uh, you know, as though it were 1995, because uh, they don't yet trust the public blockchain, they, or public blockchains. They, they don't 
feel it's uh, uh, private enough or scalable enough, essentially, so similar reasons uh, to 1995. Um, eventually, we all made it to the public internet. Uh, that's going to happen. Uh, currently, we and literally 10,000 or more other companies are, are building components for public uh, protocol systems, public blockchain and related systems, uh, and we've got these hundreds of elements that are maturing, whether it's uh, tokenized swaps or uh, support networks or an adjacent music industry infrastructure, uh, all these little components are able to be woven together. Um, because it's a single execution space, uh, if we stand up an adjacent music industry uh, network um, and then somebody comes along and puts an insurance contract uh, on the Ethereum blockchain, um, that adds value to this network and any other system that wants to use that insurance contract. So uh, we're going to see um, you know, gradual improvement for a while, uh, but it's an exponential curve. Suddenly it's going to be everywhere. Do we still, a question for both of you, um, is the corporation the ultimate middle layer and a few years or maybe it's decades down the road, do we still need that? entity? Do we need an Uber or do we just figure out something that works like Uber but there is no Uber? Well, I think we always have corporations because they are tools, they are technologies for us being able to gather together into groups of people and accomplish something that as individuals would otherwise be hard. Hopefully what we have though are marketplaces that operate a little bit less like Uber at the center of the ride hailing industry where your only choices are other centralized organizations and uh, perhaps look less like the role that Facebook has in the social network space. Uh, and look a little bit more decentralized, right? Or a lot more decentralized. Um, uh, and, and, uh, and look a little bit more like consortia, right? Uh, look more like cooperative systems. Uh, so I think it opens the door to a lot of corporate structures that weren't, impossible, weren't really easy to implement before. Uh, and that might change things, but hopefully it makes us more portable. Helps us, it helps us as individuals feel less like we are subjects on different, different empires, you know, uh, and more like independent free acting actors. Technology has yeah. been playing so. such a big role in politics, in government, in elections. How does blockchain um, enter into that equation? Or either one of you. Um, well, blockchain uh, can enable um, better uh, voting systems, more trustworthy voting systems, different governance systems. Um, I kind of want to jump back to, to uh, uh, Brian's point, uh, we're moving into a world where the nature of the firm is going to be radically transformed uh, using some of these decentralized governance systems. Um, we, uh, you know, Kevin Awaki of our Gitcoin project just wrote a, a blog uh, post um, describing flash corporations. Uh, so uh, in addition to decentralized Uber where we won't have that strong intermediary, those things can persist for a long time, but we're going to have these uh, much more dynamic uh, groupings of people and resources. They're going to pop up, they're going to solve their problem, and then they're going to uh, diffuse into uh, the subspace of potential uh, and be ready to do it again. Just because the barrier to entry uh, to form these things and run these things is going to be so low, uh, and so we're going to see a much more dynamic uh, last, economy. Last, last question again. I'd like to get um, perspective from both of you. How does our experience of the Internet change on a day-to-day -day basis in the foreseeable future as blockchain takes so in? I, I think uh, we're moving to a worldwide web or a decentralized worldwide web. Uh, currently, uh, we surrender uh, aspects of our identity in order to access, uh, to use many services on the World Wide web. Um, we're going to be participating in these protocol-based open networks uh, from our own identity construct with our persistent portable reputation. We're going to be in control of encrypted personal information. We're going to be able to selectively disclose that information uh, in situations that we designate rather than uh, have it not secured well or uh, potentially abused by corporations. We, ha we have an identity construct. Uh, Brian has a, a similar identity construct. The, um the Edelman Trust Survey, which is a survey that's gone on for 25 years, has documented the decline of trust by consumers in brands, in professions, in uh, the government, right? We're living in a world where we can't trust what we see on TV, we can't trust what we read, and we, we almost wonder if we can't trust our elections, right? Uh, and right now, elections aren't audited, right? They're, they're barely like, like, uh, uh, verifiable. Um, 
this technology, it's not, it's, I mean, it's called the trust technology or the trust protocol, but I kind of have Ronald Reagan in my head when he said, trust but verify. This is a technology that allows us, allow us to verify what we know about the world within our own industries or writ large. And um, that verification hopefully will allow us to build systems that can conquer this feeling of helplessness that I think a lot of us have when thinking about our digital personas, our activities online, the way we build our businesses. Can we, if we can rebuild society using verification and trust, I think we'll be in a much better place. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you.